and let's just agree that these are going to be very, very simple. Let's relate it back to something that we've talked about. What, if I have mentioned this word once, I bet I've said it a hundred times in this class. What act am I talking about that governs lean priority? The Connor Act. The Connor Act. The Act. You're even making hand signals. The day of the exam, you're going to be making hand signals. I won't even consider it cheap. Okay? So the Connor Act basically puts an emphasis on you being the first to record. Just as a quick reminder, what's the first thing that's always paid at a foreclosure sale? No, I tricked you. I tricked you. The attorney's fees, the cost of sale is the first thing that is paid. Don't assume. Don't assume. My enunciation, I apologize for my enunciation. I will try to do better. The first lien that is paid would be your real property taxes. Then everything else is based on its date and time of recordation. Would you agree with that? What about, um, special assessments? Special assessments will be treated just like real property taxes. Okay. You want to know why? Well, because there was a question where it said what would be the second one, and the answer was <coughs> special assessments. They would be paid right behind real property taxes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And the reason for that is, what is a special assessment? Isn't it just a Tax is a tax by another name, is what I'm now That was the logic behind that question. Okay. Then things start lining up based on their priority, right? The first mortgage is a first mortgage because it's first recorded, not because it's the biggest and best, but because it's first. So look what we're getting ready to talk about here. We're talking about mortgage priorities. Notice that we say on the exam, after talking to you about first, second, third, and all that, I might not use those words on the exam. I might talk about a first mortgage and a junior mortgage. Do you understand that a junior mortgage is behind a first mortgage? Just like generationally you would use it, okay? No trick implied. We just don't always say first and second, okay? Then we throw in a word that's kind of a strange word, the concept of subordination. Have we talked about subordination in this class? I guess it feels like I talked about it recently, and I thought I actually wrote it on that board. I actually go home and dream about you guys, and that's probably what happened. I was dreaming about it, and I thought I had already said it to you, but I'll say it now, okay? Subordination means voluntarily allowing someone to jump ahead of you in priority. Voluntarily allowing someone to jump ahead of you in priority. Obviously, I'm talking loans here, right? Okay? Well, if lean priority is so important, why would I ever allow someone to jump in front of me? That sounds strange, doesn't it? Voluntarily allowing someone to go ahead of you in priority. Okay. Now, I used to try to make up these interesting examples about subordination. And I had this guy in class one day. He was a lender. He said, Chris, you don't have to be creative. Let me give you a great example of subordination. I've never thought about this. But let's say that you have a first mortgage of $160,000. In my dream, I used this exact same number. Just right. <laughs> Your interest rate is 7.5%. You have a second mortgage. Your interest rate is 9%. It's the year 2018, okay? If your interest rate is 7.5%, you know what I'd do if I were you? I'd refinance. You could easily get five if not better, right? Okay. First mortgage, second mortgage. Why was this guy first mortgage? He was recorded when? First. So if you refinance it, see a problem? You're never going to get first mortgage money if they're not in the first position, right? Second mortgages usually have a subordination clause. Can anyone tell me why they think that a second mortgage would voluntarily allow himself to fall behind? You give a shot to me? Okay. What, would you like to share what I'm be thinking no, about? No, this is probably wrong. <laughs> That's okay. You think about the NCAA tournament this weekend? No. No, no, no. When you said something. Okay. Well, we'll take back your volunteering. We'll save that for later. Maybe the second one is higher. Say again? Yeah, the first one is higher. Higher. Okay. This guy right here doesn't want to be paid off. Why? He doesn't want to be paid off because he's getting fat 9% interest, right? So oftentimes what second mortgages say is, no, we're okay. We'll let some matter of fact they charge you for it. They'll usually charge you like 250 bucks 
to allow someone to jump ahead of you. And now, what did you get? Well, you got a great run. I mean, you got you dropped your interest rate two and a half percent. I know you still have this bad boy sitting out there at nine percent, but he didn't really want to get paid off anyway. He's content to sit there and collect that nine percent. So after the guy told me that story, I'm like, oh, gosh, that makes all the sense in the world that second mortgages at higher interest rates would obviously have a subordination clause. Allowing someone to go ahead of you in priority. Okay, I can see the reason. Subordinate is level one warranty, okay? Got it? Got it. Well, keep in mind now, keep in mind, if there was a foreclosure, obviously I would want to get paid first. But remember, the one that's going to get paid first is also the one that's getting a lower interest rate. The reason this guy's getting a, low, a higher interest rate, why is the 40000 getting a higher interest rate? Higher credit. It's more risk. Yeah. More risk. And so if you have more risk, you charge more interest for it. One of the things that they do is they say if someone's going to jump ahead of us in priority, the two loans added together can't be more than X percent loan to value. So in other words, they want to make sure that you don't extend yourself too far. But beyond that, they don't really want to get paid off. Yeah, if you had to go to the mortgage, well remember, if there's a third mortgage here, it's going to be tougher to do because then you need this guy and this guy to agree to allow you to, uh, uh, to allow them to support them. Well, it's going to be based on its date and time of recordation. They're, they're, now, remember, it's not great because when you refinance, that's going to be paid off. And this new one would be uh, would be uh, have lien priority based on when it's recorded. Okay, so it would be a second. There's no way a bank can give you money under those circumstances. Okay, mortgage priorities, senior mortgages versus junior mortgages, and then the word subordination. And then, just real quickly on uh, this, please you know, make sure you read over this, but this is just kind of filler information here. Are you guys familiar with the concept of a credit score? Credit scoring companies, they score you based on uh, a range from 300 to 850, it uh, says here. There are three credit reporting scenarios. I will tell you this, when you get ready to buy uh, a home, to borrow money to buy a home, you need to get either yourself or your borrowers, your buyers, their borrowers, in front of a lender quickly. Once they know they want to buy, because if they have problems with their credit scores, the lenders might be able to tell them how to, without changing anything, set themselves up for a higher credit score. A higher credit score gets you a, um, a better interest rate. And over the life of a loan, it's worth a little bit of work now to save yourself some money in the uh, future. There's, you know, when we got ready to, uh, uh, to refinance our house. We were so proud of ourselves so we paid down a bunch of credit card uh, debt and we're like, we're going to cut up our credit cards, we're going to cancel our accounts, blah, blah, blah. And the said, don't do it now. Don't do it now. Because even though we had open lines of credit, they had zero balances. So we had a lot of credit, but not much. And we had a lot of credit potential, but not a lot of actual money borrowed. And so if we had cut up all those cards, the amount a borrowing potential, it would have changed the ratio of our credit to our potential of our credit. So she said, don't cut it up now. Wait till afterwards, you can cut up those credit cards if you want to. It'll actually hurt your credit score. And we're like, how can that possibly hurt our credit score? Paying off credit cards and cutting up our uh, cards. Do you know if you don't have any debt, you have a What's that? You don't well, you don't have debt. If you don't have debt, you don't have a credit score. Right. Yeah, so there's nothing to score you on. And there's other things as well. And one of the good things about being uh, older is just because I've had credit for so much longer, I can have a credit score higher than, say, my nieces and nephews could because they're in their 20s and 30s. They don't have that longevity uh, score. So all these things go into calculating the uh, credit score. Let the lenders figure it out. Get your buyers in front of a good lender and let them figure it out. You're doing them a favor. Importance of your credit history, reread uh, through that. That's, uh, you can just kind of thump through that. Pre qualified buyers, does this look familiar? 2836, do you remember doing a math problem on that? You better remember doing a math problem on uh, that. Oh, we can decide something real quickly while we're here. Did we say 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock on Friday? Yes. For math? Yes. Specifically and strictly, okay? Okay, well, there, that's decided. We can move on. 
Qualifying, we have maximum affordability, we have minimum income questions. These are clearly in your notes. Feel free to look at these, but you have homework on this. That's why I'm flying through. Are you with me? Emily, are you with me? Okay. Financial legislation. Oh, man. Looks like this is where we have to stop. Crap. Okay. Can you get to this slide? Financial legislation. Hey, it looks like it doesn't. Earlier, we talked about RESPA, though. This is going to get us pointed to the truth and lending side of it. Okay. Remember, TRID included both of them, right? But we're going to talk more about the uh, truth and lending side. Let's talk about a couple of things that are the same. Did we talk about the purpose of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau oversight agency for seven, seven federal agencies, an umbrella organization that was not uh, created? It oversees all major lending laws, including RESPA, which we talked about, Truth in Lending, which I, I bet we're getting ready to talk about. You content? Okay, let's move on. Let's stop here. Okay, when I say stop, I mean it's time to start taking notes. Okay, Truth in Lending, referred to as Regulation Z. Now, Jim asked an important question just a moment ago. Um, I'm not too worried about RESPA, it's almost always referred to as RESPA, but truth in lending for test purposes is almost always referred to as Regulation Z. In other words, we may not call it truth in lending, we'll call it Regulation Z, and we want you to understand what we're talking about. Okay? That's just where it comes in the code. Okay, in regards to Regulation Z, truth in lending, Think about, I want you to think about this comment for just a moment. I have often said that there's only one fair test question we can ask you about truth in uh, lending. Having said that, we're going to ask you more, but I think there's only one that's fair. Here's why. Um, truth in lending is targeted at makers of credit. Are real estate agents makers of credit? No, you're not makers of uh, credit. However, you will find out in just a minute how it applies to real estate agents even in, in uh, advertising, okay? You are asked questions on truth in lending, so I do have to tell you a few things. Regulation Z, truth in lending, do you remember what I said the purpose was? To, give the cost of payment. to inform you of the true cost of the money that you borrowed. The true cost of the money that you borrowed. The way that a lender does that is, a lender is required to give you four disclosures. When they loan you money, they have to give you four disclosures. I'm going to go ahead and tell you all four of them, but then I want you to put a star beside one of them because one's probably more important than the others. The APR of the loan, we're going to talk a lot about APR, okay? All the finance charges, what did the bank charge you for making you the loan? Your loan origination fee, for example, what did the bank charge you for making the loan? The total number and amount of the payments, do you remember doing the, the interest over the life of a loan payment? Do you remember how big that number was? Okay, think about how big this number is. The total number, 360. And the amount of the uh, payments, it was all your principal, all your interest, and all your finance charges, right? And then the total amount that you actually uh, finance. Yeah, that's something that Don't worry too much about that. Don't worry too much about it. It's what, it's what it costs them to make you this one. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. It's, it's the, the things that they charge you just to make you the one. Okay? They have to disclose these to you. I used to have a, a great attorney that I uh, used for our uh, closings, and the thing I liked about them is that, uh, and you'll love this about attorneys when you get in the uh, field, they're extraordinarily smart and capable at what they do, but they also make closing entertaining. Closing is not entertaining. Usually if a buyer is getting a loan, they're signing, signing a ton of documents. They're signing uh, uh, land documents about the property, but they're also signing loan documents as well. And they could be, it, it could be dramatic how many things they're signing. When my attorney would get to the truth in lending statement, he would call it the confusion in lending statement. And the reason he would is no buyer who's ever signed this has understood what it was about. Because what it tells you, my interest rate is 4.8%, but my APR could have been 4.25%. And, and if you look at it and say, well, that's not what I was quoted, 
Well, yeah, that's not what you're quoted. But here's what the APR is. It's now time to talk about the APR. Okay? Yes. What does it stand for? APR stands for annual percentage rate. My definition is going to be unfulfilling, but write it down anyway. APR, annual percentage rate. Good? Here's the definition. It's the true cost of the money borrowed. So that sounds familiar. The true cost of the money borrowed expressed as an annual interest rate. If you'd like to hear some good news, I have some good news for you. Okay? You do not have to know how to do this calculation. <laughs> The uh, APR is the true cost of the money borrowed expressed as an annual interest rate. All this other stuff right here tells you the true cost of the money borrowed. The APR turns it into an interest rate. So let me give you an idea about how this works. And remember, you don't have to do this calculation. Okay? So here's the deal. You go to the bank to borrow $200,000 at 4% interest. Okay? Now, they give you $200,000. They charge you a 1% finance charge. Okay? 1% finance, 1% is how much? 2000 $2,000. So picture this again. They gave you $200,000. How much did you turn around and give them right back? Two hundred. So it's essentially like you didn't really borrow 200000 It's really like you borrowed how much? It's really like you borrowed one ninety eight. So what the APR does is your interest rate was actually calculated on two hundred thousand dollars. Your monthly payment it was calculated at four hundred uh, two hundred thousand dollars and four percent. That's your monthly payment. But you really only got one hundred eight ninety eight thousand dollars. So if you want to know how much you truly paid for that money, you take what you borrowed, you subtract out the money that you turn around and gave right back to them. It recalculates the interest and it will come out higher. Your APR is always going to come out higher. Matter of fact, if you want to do your buyers a favor, which don't. Their lender should explain this to them. Okay? <laughs> Their lender should explain this. Uh, if they go out and compare multiple loans, see if this comment makes sense to you. The one with the lowest APR will be the cheapest over the life of that loan. The loan that has the lowest APR will cost the buyer less over the life of the loan. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it's the choice cost of the money you borrowed. It takes into consideration of finance charges and fees and stuff like that. So unfortunately, when you say something like that, your buyers are saying, so Chris, you're telling me that the one with the lowest APR, that's the one I should get. No, that's not what I said. I said it'd be the cheapest over life of a loan. I'll give you an example. A 15-year loan is going to have a lower APR than a 30-year loan. <coughs> but can you afford the payment? No, then it doesn't matter if that's the cheapest money that you can get if you can't afford the uh, payment. So anyway, having said that, if I were looking at three loans that were otherwise identical and I could afford any of them, I'd go with the one that had the lowest APR because it would cost me at least over the life of the loan. Wouldn't that just mean that it's lower than the actual interest rate? Not necessarily. Someone can give you a lower interest rate and charge you a bunch of fees. Okay. okay? And they can disguise it. So that's what the APR does, is it takes away the disguising factor and evens them all out. Okay. APR, the true cost of the money borrowed, expressed as an annual interest rate. And the, it, the key of it is the true cost of the money borrowed. That's what, uh, and that's what buyers are being informed of. Even if they don't know it, that's what they're being informed of. Would y'all like to talk some more about uh, RESPA? Because I could go all day on RESPA. It's like one of my favorite subjects, but I feel like we've already talked about it. Virginia, would you like to hear more? I was loving Virginia. I got nothing else to say about rest. Uh, let's see, truth in lending, uh, in, uh, rest of integrated disclosure. I feel like we talked about that. You can deal with that. The three day rule includes Saturdays, right? Okay. Three days prior to closing, you're going to get the final CD that has the final numbers on it. All that sounds familiar? Please say yes. Yes. Okay. I missed something in truth and lending. Uh, hold on one second here. I'm going to stipulate that we talked about all that, so I feel good about it, but there is one thing that I need to say about truth and lending. It's not on here. Can you just add this about truth and lending regulation Z? This was the part that I think is actually testable. 
anywhere where you're taking notes on truth and lending. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to, you already know truth and lending and Regulation Z are the same thing, right? So we can stipulate that. Regulation Z, advertising, I want you to associate the words advertising. I want you to associate the word trigger terms. Sounds like you can start with some trigger terms, right? But you don't know what that means yet. And full disclosure. Trigger. I started to say that more than I was but that wouldn't help me with it. What was it, Dale Evans horse? Roy Rogers horse, right? Okay. Trigger terms. So here's the deal. If you, I need to pay attention right now, okay? If you were to advertise any specific finance term, you must fully disclose the material terms of the loan, okay? Write that down. I was writing it down. I'm sorry, I said listen. I didn't say write. <laughs> Let me be more specific. Listen and write. Okay, Daniel, here we go. If you advertise any specific, and please underline the word specific, comma, finance, and underline the word finance, term. If you advertise any specific finance term, comma, you must fully disclose the material terms of the loan. I would never use the word said, but otherwise what you said is okay. On, on the there you go. Was that like the example you were giving us when your company was buying down points and shipping Do you remember the little asterisk that I had beside yeah. it? Yep. Do you, have you ever heard a car commercial when they talk really, really fast at the end? That's what they're saying. Maybe it's a base call. Sixteen dollars, sixty seven cents, or thousand dollars. Can you give us any No, I'm sorry, that part. <laughs> if, if, uh, if you advertise any specific finance term, uh -huh. comma, you must fully disclose the material terms of the loan. <laughs> if you advertise any what? Specific, specific finance, finance term. term. It triggers the fact that you must fully disclose. Do you now know what a trigger term is? Can you define for me a trigger term? Yes. APR. Any specific financing term. Okay. Now, let's see if you can recognize it. For test purposes, let's see if you can recognize a specific <laughs> finance term. Do you accept this challenge? Yes. Here it comes. Buy this lovely home for only $667 per month. Trigger term or not? Yes. Yes. Was it both specific and a finance term? Yes. Eric, you were slow to commit. I'm slow to commit, but I did. Okay, now you Okay. All right, let's try this one then. FHA, finance and available. No. Has to do with finance, but it's not a specific term, is it? There's lots of fun programs within there. Very good. Buy this lovely home with only $500 down. Yes. Yes. That's specific and a finance term. Buy this home for only $180,000. No. Oh, you guys are smart. You guys are smart. It was specific, wasn't it? But it was not a what? Finance. Finance term. Okay. All right. All right. Let's see if I can trick you here. HOA fees, $50 per month. No. 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 Specific, but not a finance term. I can't trick you. Okay. <laughs> That's the you know that's exactly the way we would ask this if it were to come up. If something is expressed as a number and it's a financing term, it's probably a trigger term. What does it trigger? Full disclosure. Come down to the bottom and get your very very smallest font that you can possibly get and write down at the bottom that this is a two one buy down year one payment six sixty seven year two eight thirty three years three two thirty or one thousand dollars. Okay, all that is in fact disclosed. That's a trigger term. The only reason, the reason I think that that's fair is, as a real estate agent, will you ever run an ad that has a specific finance term in it? I did. When I was selling new homes, we did it all the time. Normally what I would do is we would do it in concert with a uh, lender. Okay, they'd split the ad with us because they want the business, we want the uh, business, we'd split the ad. They knew the regulatory side of it on that side, we knew the regulatory on the real estate side. So we actually had two sets 
Chris Potts looking at it like this. Okay. Now, having said that, you're getting very close to another topic. You're getting close to another topic. Advertising and regulation in general. We're going to talk about three, three things in this class. And I'm talking, when I say this class, I mean just class, the whole semester. If I were your broker in charge, if I were your broker in charge, there are three regulatory issues that I would look at. If you call an ad to me and say, Chris, do you think this ad is okay? There are three regulatory issues that I would look at. We have discussed two of them. You have read about one of them. Let's see how many of them you can get. Go. Fair Fair you got them quick. I thought you were going to have to strain a little bit. The correct answer was the one we're talking about right now is truth in lending, not investment. Okay. Okay. Truth in lending, regulation Z, trigger terms, that's one of them. And then what was the other one that I heard? Fair housing. Fair housing. Since you guys are so cocky, can anybody tell me the one that you've read about that I have not discussed it yet? It's very hard. No, nobody wants to take a shot at that one. Um, later when I did the license law lecture, I will talk about something known as a blind ad. A blind ad means that you, as a real estate agent, when you advertise someone's property, you must make it obvious to the public that you're a real estate professional, that it's not being advertised by the seller. But if there is you guys, we haven't talked about it yet, but y'all did really well on the first two. I'm your broker in charge, you bring me an ad, I'm going to check and make sure you spell stuff correctly, just simply because I don't want you to look foolish out there. But what I'm really worried about is going to real estate gym. So I'm going to check, make sure you haven't made a fair housing violation, I'm going to make sure you didn't make a truth in lending violation. Blind ads we'll get to on Wednesday, I'm guessing. I told you wrong. When, on Monday we're going to talk about manual tenant. Wednesday we're going to talk about license law. Okay, that's the, that's the way we're going to finish the course. All right, questions and comments on truth in lending. APR, big deal. Ooh, you want to hear a tough question? You're going to get this one this weekend, so I might as well go ahead and give it to you anyway. There's only one number that I can advertise, one financial number that I can advertise without it triggering full disclosure. Do any of you have any idea what it is and why? There's only one number that I can, one finance term, one finance term that I can express as a number without it triggering full disclosure. What term is that? See, that's not a finance term. Okay, I, I can certainly advertise that, but it's not a finance term. Lisa wants to answer this side question, so. Y'all want to give her a shot or y'all want to try to get it first? All right, Lisa, you better not be wrong. I might be wrong. What? APR. It's the APR. Because it's the true cost of the money. Because it's the true cost of the money. Right. So if you want to if you want to advertise the APR, you could, nobody know what the heck you were talking about. But you could, but you would not, it wouldn't trigger full disclosure because it said to be the true cost of the money for it. The reason that these other things trigger disclosure is I need to know what loan type you're talking about, and that way I can determine what it's going to cost. So I could actually run an ad that says, buy this home with uh, 4 and 48% APR. I could actually run that ad. But how could we get that? No, no, no. But uh, they qualify, obviously. I'd say oh, that. yeah. But, I, would, okay. but I, wouldn't have to, I wouldn't have to spell out the material terms of the loan. Because that's what you're saying. Right. Oh, okay. All right. The APR stands on its own because it's the true cost. Can you quickly just define finance? A, I uh, think of it as being a loan term. Down payment, uh, monthly payment. Weirdly enough, the number of payments, you know, buy this home were only 180 simple installments. I don't know why anybody would say that, but theoretically, if they did, that's what I mean by finance terms. Good question. Good question. I see where you're going. Okay? What else you got? Yeah? If you say you can disclose the APR without having to trigger full disclose the material terms, do you have to put something afterwards saying, for well qualified buyers? Because how can you? Yeah, I mean, certainly you, you could, certainly you could put something like uh, that. that. That wouldn't be in the material terms of one, but yeah, clearly you'd want to say, for, I like the way you said it. For, well, what if someone comes in and they go, oh, I saw your ad for this HR and was worse credit score, and no, no one will yeah. qualify? Yeah, that may fall under some uh, false advertising or something like that. Wouldn't fall under uh, truth in lending. Oh. But, but having said that, the APR, yeah, clearly you would put qualifying language in there. Not all sellers would qualify. Not all buyers would qualify. Excuse me. Uh, truth in lending applies to what type of uh, properties? Residential. Residential, backed by your primary residence. Okay? Don't offer any question that leads you to believe that the same would 
apply to commercial or business properties or things like uh, that. That's not consumer protection if it goes to that extent. What do you mean backed by primary residents? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you own a home? Did you borrow money to buy that home? If you don't pay your mortgage, what's going to happen to your home? Your loan is backed by your primary residence. So what's the other possibility to back by what? Loans for business property, loans for commercial properties, loans for investment properties like duplexes. Those are not your primary residence. Okay. Now think about it this way, and here's the connection I want you to make. The connection I want you to make is these are consumer protections. We assume professionals can take care of themselves. We worry about individual homeowners. That's the logic behind why it's those mm -hmm. residential properties as opposed to your business properties. What about the duplex? If it's an income producing uh, property, an investment property, it's not going to apply. Even if it's a duplex, it's not going to I don't know. You, I, I don't know that <laughs> yeah, that is. That's not good. That's not good. Okay, we are finished with truth and lending. We're always through with this chapter. I didn't realize we were so close to the end. Oh, that makes me sad. I was having so much fun. Oh, actually, we only have six minutes. I better speed it up. Okay, in finishing up chapter 15, and tell me why we're talking about this, aren't we talking about consumer financial legislation? Look at the name of this act the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Having said that, once you know the name of the act, part of it's obvious, right? Prohibits, well, I'm sorry, the people, yeah, yeah. prohibits discrimination in the lending process. So far, so good. You got that much from the name of the act. I will caution you right here. Hey, this sounds like it would make a great test question. I don't know if it will or not, but it sounds like it would. This is very similar to the Fair Housing Act, isn't it? Yeah. Okay? I want you to look at the classes, the protected classes that would be the same. But really, I want you to pay attention to the ones that are different. The fact of the matter is they should be easy to spot because I think it's in red. Okay. So let's talk about the, uh, what they have in common. Race, color, religion, national origin, sex, all of those come up in the uh, Fair Housing Acts as well, right? But let's talk real quickly about marital status. Was marital status protected under Fair Housing? No. No. Uh, you think of something else? Familial status was protected we under Fair Housing. Yeah. We may have mentioned it. Yeah. It may have come up in another chapter, and now we're just relating back to it at that point. Okay. But Equal Credit Opportunity Act, difference between Fair Housing and this, Fair Housing, familial status, and then Equal Credit Opportunity Act, marital status, and that's the one that. Well, I mentioned to you from the what's the seventies or eighties when uh, they used to the first question that a single female would get is where's your husband when they're applying for a loan? So marital status. That's why that's a big deal. Okay? And then age, age of course they cannot discriminate me based on the fact that I am old. If I qualify, I qualify. Dependence on public assistance, we did talk about this because I remember using the Bank of America example talking about some of this. Okay. Notice the differences, not necessarily the similarities. And then finally, the Fair Credit uh, Reporting Act. Again, it's late. It's near the end. Of, dang, I'm not gonna, we're done for a week long. So I'm only going to see you guys for the review, which is completely up to you whether you show up or not. So we're done for a week. I'm going to send you a bunch of homework this week because we only have two weekends left. Um, free, fair